The Plumber. Little bit of background information. I'm a 22-year-old female, and I just moved to a small town from a big city with my dad. We moved into our house in early October of 2015, and we were having problems with a leaky shower in the bathroom adjacent to mine. So my dad called a plumber to come take a look. The plumber arrived around 8 a.m. the following day while I was getting ready for work in my bathroom. My dad let him in, so I hadn't gotten a good look at him. My dad then apparently goes down the street to gas up his car and then go to work, leaving the plumber to do his damn job in the bathroom. Now, my bathroom is just a toilet and vanity, with a door leading into a shared shower room that has another door leading into my dad's bathroom. So while I was getting ready, there was only a door between the plumber and I. I guess he figured out that there was a lady in the house due to my hair dryer. Next thing I know, my bathroom door is opening and closing, and there's a very tall, very wide, very terrifying man with more legs than teeth locking my door from the inside behind him. He then walks five feet towards me and stops in front of my bathroom door. I freeze. He stands there staring at me for the longest 30 seconds of my life. He hits me with the widest, untoothiest grin and literally looks me up and down multiple times. I hear the front door open and close, not knowing then that my dad had forgotten his wallet, and the plumber pivots on one foot in a twirly motion and locks my door and walks out. My dad runs in my room asking if that guy had just been in there and goes to run after him, but the guy walked right to his truck and left without fixing our shower. So, my dad immediately calls the company we hired the plumber from and asks them to send someone else, but not that guy. And he tries to explain what happened to the manager. The manager proceeds to tell my dad it was our fault the man locked himself in my room with me because I didn't lock him out of my room in the first place. Sorry. Didn't know I needed to lock myself away in order not to be creeped on by a supposed professional. Just terrifying to think of what would have happened if my dad did not forget his wallet. Why wouldn't they leave? Why weren't they moving? This happened to me when I was about 15 or 16 years old. I have forgotten about this for ages, so despite being a lurker on the subreddit, I never thought to post it. A few months ago, I told a few people about it though, and their reactions made me realize it's probably worth throwing on here, because it defies explanation, and I really am curious what others would think of it. So years and years back when I was in high school, I had a few friends crashing at my place on the weekend, we were drinking a bit watching horror movies, nothing too interesting. Later on, we were polishing off whatever we had on us and sitting in my room in the dark, which was actually the den in the basement. My room sat at the back of the house, and the hallway led more or less straight into two other rooms that faced the front. Around 3 a.m. or so, we're just shooting the shit, when one of us suddenly noticed a bright white light just barely washing into my room kind of spilling across the floor and highlighting all the dust dancing around in the air. It's a very bright, artificial-looking light. Think the cheesy effects whenever the aliens show up on X-Files. Curious about what was causing this and being the guy closest to the door, I sat up and walked into the hallway to investigate. As I entered the very short hallway leading to the front basement rooms, the light was already much brighter. I noticed that it was coming from the room on the left, which did not have blinds yet. And so, the basement window faced boldly onto the street, unobscured. I walked forward and stepped into the room, and immediately froze in my tracks. Parked on the street, and pointed straight at my house, was a huge big rick kind of truck, minus the trailer. The high beams were on and filling the air, not to mention my house, with an eerie white light. To this day, I've never seen a space so lit up in the middle of the night. What really got me though, was the two individuals 
standing directly in front of the truck, right at the edge of my lawn, staring at my house. He was a very typical trucker-looking type in a ball cap, broad-shouldered husky guy, mangy clothes from what little I could see. Beside him stood some girl that looked like a teenager from her build. All I could really make out was her straggly hair. People say this a lot on Let's Not Meet, but I really did just have the intuition that something was off about these two right away, before I really had a reason to know that. What really got me was those friggin' high beams. They stood in front of the truck, so although a very bright light was at their back, I could not make out one single detail about their faces. It freaked me the fuck out. It just looked wrong. This is where the normally logical me would think they're lost, he's driving a truck after all, or any of a million normal things, really. But that's when I really picked up on what was so off about them. They were standing there, completely motionless, hands at their sides, no signs that they were talking to each other, no little shifts of body language, not even moving their weight, more from one foot to the other, as any normal person would stand. Especially for long periods of time. They just friggin' stood there staring straight ahead. At my house. At me. This is around where I got the heck out of that room and shut the door. I got my friends to come upstairs with me, so we could scope these two out from above. It was one of those split-level kind of houses. We looked down at them through the curtains, and sure enough, they... <laughs> They hadn't budged. Truck still aimed straight at my house. High beams. High beams still bursting through the windows. Two weirdos still standing completely still right in front of it. After considering many, many options, some smart, i.e. calling the police, and some completely retarded, i.e. confrontation, we opted to double check that my door was locked and get some sleep that night. I mean... S since there were a few of us, we could have someone keeping an eye on them while others slept. I remember thinking it felt like keeping watch in the Vietnam War or something. Or anyways, that's what I thought. But when it was my turn to watch them, they... They were gone. Apparently, they just stood there outside in the autumn for hours. And then went on their merry way. Yeah, that's totally normal, right? What the actual... Caramel and vanilla, okay on their own, delicious as a pear. This is my first Reddit post ever, so I apologize in advance if it's a bit odd in certain places. I live in a medium-sized town in Ontario, Canada. This town has many forests and parks, which are quite popular amongst people of all ages. This area of the city that I live in isn't very shifty as a rule. There are many families that live here, probably because of all the schools and parks that we have. I was walking in one of these parks with my friend who I'll call Anna. Anna is Muslim, has a beautiful brown complexion and brown eyes. She has black hair, and it's covered by a hijab whenever she's outside of her home. I have very pale skin and greenish-blue eyes. This seems irrelevant, but it contributes to the story. We were playing in a park one late autumn afternoon. There were a few kids playing at the playground, and a couple sitting on a bench, who I presume were their parents. There was also an old man playing tennis at the court right next to the playground. He was alone, which seemed a bit weird, but Anna and I just laughed about how funny it seemed that he was playing tennis against a netted wall, and the balls weren't coming back to him very well. Other than that, there was nobody else around. As it was getting closer to dinner time, I told Anna that I should probably walk home. My walk from this park took about 17 minutes, and involved me walking along a pretty major and busy street to get to my house. As I was leaving the park, I noticed the man playing tennis alone watch me walk on the sidewalk next to the court. He literally stopped playing, dropped a tennis ball, and watched me walk past. I felt a little weird, 
but just shook it off and kept walking. People stare at other people all the time, right? Anyways, I was waiting at a four-way stop for the pedestrian light to change. For some reason, the lights in my city seemed to take ages to change. I waited about three minutes when I heard footsteps behind me. This wasn't strange, as it was still light outside, and people walk on this major street all the time. It was an old man, the same one who had been playing tennis, about half a kilometer away from where I currently was. This meant he had to have left basically when I did, which seemed very strange. He was quite a bit taller than me and reeked of cigarettes. He was mumbling to himself until he tapped me on the shoulder and said, Nice skin. I wasn't sure if I heard him correctly, so I asked, uh, Pardon? You and your friend have pretty skin. So different from each other yet beautiful. Was his response. I thought this was a pretty weird thing to comment on, but being the naive person I am, I simply said, Oh, thank you, and reached into my backpack for my phone. Finally, the light changed, and I crossed the street. The man stayed and crossed the other way, but walked back around, so he was on the same side of the street as me. He followed about 20 meters back the whole time. I, uh, I was very scared but I knew that in a few minutes I'd be home anyways. Since there are many connected streets, I decided to turn and walk up the street that's a couple before mine, as he was gaining on me and didn't want him following me to my actual street. Just as I was about to turn onto the street, he came over my shoulder and said, It's like the saying goes, caramel and vanilla, they're okay on their own, but they're delicious as a pair. Thank goodness the man didn't continue to follow me onto the street. I just turned as quickly as possible and waited for the man to disappear behind the end of the street house before I took off running. It wasn't until I was safely in my home that his words settled in. I shivered and felt sick. The Shed and the Squatter This happened a few weeks ago, and it ties into an older story a little, so I'll talk about that first. When I was about 16 years old, I went to a party with some at the time newly made friends, Mary, Jane, Ashley, and Kate. I was new to the area, and I'd never been to a real party before, so it was a big thing for me. We were sleeping over at Kate's place, owned by her parents. There were two houses on the property, the main house and a small secondary house with two bedrooms and a small living area. The property itself was about 10 minutes drive from town and set off a busy highway. There were two paddocks between it and the houses, with a tree line that hid the houses from view. It was secluded, so we felt pretty safe. No one would just walk out here and you have to know the houses existed in order to even find them, since the area is well known for having a lot of roads off the highway that lead to back roads and the like. The small house was a bit away from the main house, separated from it by a large hedge and a tall gum tree. It was perfect for some teen girls to hold a party away from the adults, and we all assumed it was pretty safe. So there we were five girls, three movies and a bunch of alcohol, the girls' parents didn't mind if we drank, as long as they knew what and how much we were drinking and were on the main property. They expected us to be straightforward, which we were, and while there was enough alcohol to get drunk, it wasn't enough to go stupid. We started the night with a certain horror movie that included a mask-wearing villain and Sarah Michelle G as the lead actress. About halfway through it, it was interrupted by screams as a bat flew through the window. It was summer and the breeze was great and landed on Mary's head. Cue screams, laughter, my catching and releasing the bat. I was the only one willing to go near the poor thing and the rest of the night ending in a decent haze of us telling horror stories. Most of the stories were pretty tame or stuff we'd heard before. 
The old escaped mental patient, with a hook hand creeps up on lovers making out in the car, and the like. There were a few local legends that caught my attention, since I love creepy stuff and didn't know the local stuff yet. Nothing too scary until it came to Kate's turn. It was a pretty normal story about the local mental asylum. Less an asylum than a daycare center for the mentally unfit, and an escape patient who had been last seen living in an old shack not far from the property, who snuck into a nearby house and killed some kids having a party there. That shack just so happened to be the same shack she would pointed out when we arrived earlier that day, in a paddock that wasn't part of her parents' land, but still pretty close to the property. It was spookier for having seen the old shack and knowing how close it was to the house. Still, we managed to sleep safe and sound, and soon daylight came and I went home, having made new friends and established myself as a bit of a badass by actually touching the bat. I'm a bit of a wuss, so that didn't last long, though the friendships did. Fast forward about 16 years. Three of us still live in the same area, still keep in touch, and are still pretty good friends. It had been a while since we got together, and Kate, Jane, the other girl who stayed, and I, decided it was time to have another get-together. Kate now had a family. Jane and I were still single, and happy for it. So we decided to leave the kids with Kate's husband for the night, and stay out in the small house. We were excited, stocking up on our favorite drinks and snacks, picking out some new and old horror movies, and just planning ourselves a good time. The night arrives, and we're happily packed into the little lounge area. Now, one thing I didn't mention is that this small house has large glass windows in the lounge area, front and back. The two bedrooms are to the left and right, with a small bathroom inside the larger one, the windows in the lounge, though, line both front and back and are basically, basically the walls. You can see straight through the house during the day. There is a sliding door towards the main house that you go through to enter. So, being still relatively warm at night, having just begun autumn, we've got two of the windows open. Now with fly wire to keep out the flies, mozzies, and bats. The curtains are drawn back so as not to block the breeze, and we're sitting watching scary movies. It is a great setup for a horror movie as you're imagining, yes. So, three drunk women, all rather small. Kate is a little stockier after having kids, and while Jane works out a lot, she likes to wear baggy clothes, so you can't tell she's got muscle under them and looks pretty small. And me? Well, I'm pretty short, and while I have a little poundage, I also tend to wear baggy clothes, so I look a bit like a midget. I'll hang out with windows wide open, watching a movie in a room that can easily be looked into. The first movie ends, deliberately. It's the same movie as that time, all those years ago. And we joke about bats flying in and scaring us to bits. Suddenly, mid-laugh, the power cuts out. We go stock still for a moment then scrabble for a torch, freaking out a little. Kate finds it, we were gonna use it for scary tales later on so it wasn't far, and decides she'll take a look at the generator to the side of the house. Being a farmy, she knows how things run, and since we can see the lights from the main house, we can see the grounds a bit, so we've calmed down a little. A power shortage is bound to be the cause, right? So. She slips out and Jane grabs a can and stands outside to cool off a bit. I join her, sans can, and we shoot the shit while we wait for Kate to come back. We can hear her grunting and cursing as she wrestles with whatever. Now I'm not good with mechanics. I can change a fuse and unclog a sink or, or change a washer, but that's about it. Suddenly, she cheers, the lights flicker on and we head back inside. All's wells again, and we decide to forgo another horror movie and head on to the comedies instead. So, we're watching some comedy, and I can't get invested in it. Something is making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Kate has been nursing a can for half an hour. Jane has stopped drinking altogether and keeps fidgeting, moving positions every five minutes or so. I look up at Kate, 
and catch her eyes widen in shock at the same time as some stupid jump scare happens in the movie. We all jump, and a few minutes pass, before Jane says she needs to use the bathroom, and Kate says, It's gotten pretty cool now, let's close the windows, okay? Quite a bit louder than she needed to, since it's only me in the room. Feeling something is wrong, I decide to go along with her and close the second window, while she closes the first. I notice that she's locking the window too, and checking the other ones nearby as she does so. Taking the hint, I do the same. She looks at me, I look back and nod. All the windows seem locked. She then sprints to the door and slams it shut, locking it. I'm a bit in shock, not sure what she's doing, but figuring that... She's doing it for a good reason. Kate doesn't spook easily and she's a very rational person. She then grabs the torch by hand and drags me to the bedroom, locks the door and gets me to help her push the drawer set next to the door against it. Jane isn't in the bathroom. Instead, she's peeking out the curtains carefully, holding a very ugly vase in her hand, like it's a freaking sword or something. Color me freaked. Something is going on, and I have no idea what the hell it is, but two of my best friends are acting like paranoid nutters, and I'm totally in the dark as to why. Five seconds later, there's a huge bang, 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 coming from the lounge area and screaming starts. It was hard to make out what the guy was screaming about, mainly profanities and something about missing the best parts, but it was definitely a man's voice and the man in question was very much disturbed. Terrified, I pushed against the dresser, just in case whoever it was got into the lounge and started beating down the door. The screaming turns into ear-piercing screeches, and we're all three panicking. Jane keeps peering out the window, ready to smash the vase on anything that pokes through it. Kate's wielding the torch like it's a baton, and I'm frantically clinging to the drawers, I searching desperately for something to use as a weapon, just as I've decided to use a stiletto stick out from under the bed that I can reach if I roll to the left, there's suddenly the sound of running, and the screeching gets further away before just stopping. We sit there for a moment, terrified to move. I was breathing pretty heavily, and my heart was racing so hard it was all I could hear. Suddenly. There's a giggle next to the window. A really creepy man giggle. Jane backpedals, scrambling back towards Kate and I, and I'm inching to the left, towards the shoe because I am not going to die without stabbing my attacker with something sharp and pointy. I damn well refuse to. The creepy giggles continue at the window, and there's this odd sound, like someone is trying to scratch at the glass. It's really, really creepy, and we're really freaking out. Suddenly, we hear Kate's husband shout, Hey, you! What the hell do you think you're doing? And a gunshot. Now, I live in Australia. We have strict gun laws. I didn't even know that Kate's husband had a gun, but apparently, he has a rifle since they live in the bush and have to deal with kangaroos and other wildlife pretty often, and he knows how to use it. There's a sound of running and branches breaking. Jake, the husband, yells at someone to keep going and never come back or else. Another gunshot. Then everything goes quiet for a while. Finally, we hear Jake telling us to come out, that it's safe. Cops are called and take their time to arrive, then take statements. That's when I hear what exactly I'd miss. Apparently, while I was only feeling weird and paranoid, Kate actually saw a reflection in the glass of the window of a man's face behind us. She said he looked old, with really worn-out skin. Like leather, really old leather, and wild eyes that were really crazy and shining. She also said, from what she could tell, he had no teeth, and that his hair was made it to hell. Jake said he didn't get a good look of the guy's face, but said his clothes were really old and tattered and that he'd warm a look like an old dark coat, 
dirty brown pants and boots of some kind. Kate then sent Jane a text, which told her to go to the bathroom and ring the house number, telling Jake to get his rifle because there was a possible intruder on the property. While Jane did that, Kate gave a good reason to close and lock the windows and doors, then grabbed me as well, blockaded ourselves in the room. Jane had actually seen the guy prowling when she was on the way to the toilets, and had drawn all the curtains after checking the windows. Jane also said that she felt like someone was watching us earlier when Kate was fixing the power, and Kate said that she's not sure that the power failure was just a normal power outage, or if there was some tampering. It was dark and she couldn't tell, but we decided that it was a bit too coincidental that it just happened to go out like that. The rest of that night we spent in the main house, just talking, coming down over cups of tea and trying to get the kids back to bed. I mean, the gunfire had woken them up. Later learned that the guy wasn't found, but his campsite was. The old shack where locals said escaped mental patients used to live. Police seemed to think that he was just a squatter who was drawn to the light of the TV and sounds of merriment. The shack has since been bought by Kate, and a few days ago, she and Jake tore it down, she said. She couldn't rest easily knowing it could be used by anyone who could harm her family, even if they were just squatters. She got plans to get a few alpacas, great protectors, and home them in that paddock in case the guy decides to come back. Oh, and squatter dude, let's not meet, please. Just carry on your merry way down that highway and don't murder anyone, okay?